Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's Andrew O'Donnell with The Market Mindset. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to speak with Kobe Kushner again. Uh, Kobe, uh, as you might remember, has a great uh, deal of experience, not only as a mining engineer, but as an analyst, has his level three CFA. Uh, he was at Red Cloud, uh, and I wanted to reach out to him because I, I didn't realize he'd, he'd moved on, and he's got his own private venture named Libra Lithium. And I thought, listen, if I could grab him to give like give a bit of an educational look at lithium and the case for lithium, but also from the kind of point of view of a supply chain, you know, where Canada stands and specifically hard rock, because we've talked about DLE and clays and brines and whatnot. But I wanted someone to come in with the perspective of hard rock and also why that's important here in Canada, too. So, Kobe, CEO of Libra, congratulations. And uh, how, how are you? I'm great. And thanks a ton for the warm welcome, Andrew. It's good to see you again and, and to be back on your show. Well, it's great. Uh, we love having you. We love having someone with the expertise, not only in the, the mining, specifically in engineering space, but like as a, a as an analyst. I mean, because, you know, for our crowd, they want to know how can I make money in this this area? So sure. So it's a real pleasure to get to chat with you again. And, and let's talk about this kind of grassroots opportunity in lithium. Yeah, I think I think why there is such an opportunity in grassroots lithium specifically is because it hasn't it hasn't really been done before, right? You look at what pegmatites are currently being drilled off, and a lot of those were, you know, historically documented by old government mapping uh, campaigns, or were essentially found by accident. You know, there's countless examples out there. Uh, the Tanko mine in Manitoba. Uh, they were that's a that was a blind. They found that by accident, right? Mm -hmm. Like they were chasing tin anomalies. Um, PMET, Patriot Battery Metals, and their their Corvette project, right? Like that was that was a gold project. Spodumene was noted there uh, in the early 2000s when Virginia gold mines had it. There's a, a story, I don't know if it's true, of a geologist having his lunch on the pegmatite and noted some spodumene and moved on. No At way. the time, no one cared, right? Yeah. 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 So I guess the, the whole idea behind Libra, at least our, our hard rock component to the story is that, okay, let's let's ignore closeology completely. You know, you got you got a lot of companies out there that are marketing closeology, but something I learned as an analyst is closeology does not necessarily mean prospectivity. That being said, it it's clear that some investors like that. They're like, oh, it's right next to PMED. It's right next to yes, yeah. you know, Frontier. But you know, it, our approach is a bit different. It's it's more okay. Let's let's ignore closeology completely. Let's. Focus on the fact that there hasn't been any concerted effort to to look for new uh, lithium deposits. Instead, let's let's think. Okay, where should lithium bearing pegmatites occur? Let's stake it and let's explore it. That's that's the approach behind Libra. I'm not saying that's the right approach. It's the approach that we're taking. Yeah, no, I I, I love that when people just state, here's our thesis, and uh, some people will like it, some won't. Like you're saying, some like the closeology because maybe they think just the marketing dollars there's going to be movement, but this is this is the thesis, uh, and obviously it was great because you've assembled a management team that's very very impressive, that also feels the same way, and I think that go that that's important to point out before we get too much into this this grassroots case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and after all, like I'm I'm here to, I guess educate and. I'm not really here to promote Libra. One of the no. benefits of being private is that, you know, we're driven by discoveries and not press releases. Yes. Um, that being said, I am here to promote the case for grassroots lithium exploration. Um, there's a lot of companies out there, but I think uh, I think we need more discoveries if we ever want to hope to uh, fulfill that growing lithium supply deficit. So you know, what is lithium? It's the third element on the periodic table. It's a critical mineral deemed by several governments, USA, Canada, even China. Um, it's the lightest metal on the periodic table. And what that means is that it, it translates to uh, superior energy density by being very, very light, right? It's the lightest conductive material out there. Um, so that's why it's constant across the major EV battery chemistries that you see, like whether that's NMC, LFP, right? You see nickel being engineered out for or substituted with uh, and and cobalt being substituted, uh, phosphate being substituted for, for different chemistries. But lithium seems to be the one constant throughout it. And 
I think, you know, there's a lot to talk about, you know, vanadium redox flow batteries, sodium ion batteries, especially lately. But uh, the reality is, is if you're, if, if you're uh, designing a product that's meant to move, whether that's your cell phone or an electric vehicle, you want energy density. Mm, yeah. Sodium ion batteries, I, I don't know if it's actually going to have a place in, um, in electric vehicles, right? You know, maybe as, uh, as someone else, as another analyst uh, referred to it as those might be useful for what he referred to as glorified uh, golf carts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also like the graphene type ones, like those, uh, I mean, there's cost with graphene. And I've seen ones like that that are good, but they're more for that, uh, like internet of things, like the very small batteries. And those are, my understanding is some of those graphene batteries, um, you, they still use lithium in it, right? Of course, yes, yes. But, yeah, so the so lithium ion batteries, they're, they, they're on the cathode side and then graphite, graphene, they'd be on the anode side. Um, but, uh, it, you know, even, even like new up and coming technologies, like, uh, solid state batteries, they, they still use lithium in in a totally different way, but they use it, they use lithium in metal form. Again, it, it all comes back to it being the lightest metal on the periodic table and needing that energy density. Yeah. I mean, there's weight is obviously a factor when you're trying to move anything, whether it's a car or <laughs> a phone, anything weight plays a big mm -hmm. role. Yeah. And, and just size, right? Like you. The, I don't know how big your office is, but a vanadium redox flow battery, for example, is the size of my office. Yes. Right? It's not <laughs> something you could strap onto your cell phone. Yes. Um, great for grid energy storage, potentially. Um, but, uh, and, and we've seen this, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at it in front of me, the, the supply problem, right? And I, I was talking to you about this before that historically governments, policymakers, but also OEMs and uh, chemical producers, they've historically been uh, funding the wrong side of the supply chain. The whole yes. supply chain, you know, needs dollars, but they, they've been putting it at the, at all the way uh, downstream, right? They're saying like, oh, well, we need EVs, let's build more EV plants. And then it's like, oh, we need batteries now for these EVs, let's build some gigafactories. And it, it trickles all the way down to, oh, crap, we don't actually have resources available <laughs> to, to provide feed for for all these uh, uh, chemical plants. Right? Yeah, we were but, speaking before, and I said, I've heard that from a lot of people. Because at first, I remember we were speaking, I thought, no, it can't be like that. But I've heard it so much. And it, it yeah. also kind of makes sense, because everyone likes to hear about the technology side. Ooh, it's a battery plant. It's this and it's that. That's exciting. If they think, well, we have to get those... Uh, all those elements and all those uh, metals from somewhere, people are less interested in, in that. But I mean, if you're a government or you're trying to have an overall blueprint strategy, you, I mean, if they had taken say the 13 billion that went into v, that they're giving to VW and, and just said, Hey, we're going to give each of these mining companies 10, $20 million to go find some stuff. I mean, that would yeah. be huge. That's how you develop a local North American supply chain. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to a fundamental misunderstanding about the mining industry, right? Like uh, a lot of these policymakers are anyone that lives in a city, you know, they're they're far removed from the industry. Yeah. Um, may, maybe they're more in tune with the financial side of things, but as a, as as far as actually being there out on the ground, they're quite far removed. And something that a lot of them don't understand is how long it takes to actually put a new mine into production, right? So it's it's like oh well there's resources over here, don't worry there's there's enough lithium out there but it's like okay well there's actually not that many, yes. you know I get I can count on 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 my on maybe one hand the the number of projects that actually could be coming online in the next year right like it's yeah I, and even ones like a Thacker Pass I mean it's not like it's a slam dunk and that has the U.S. government support trying to push yeah. it through I mean it's not easy. <laughs> It's it's not easy, especially you know with the clays, um, because look, there's there's a reason they haven't been commercialized yet before. Um, you know, Lithium Americas has a big responsibility on their shoulders to to do it right, because you know if they fail, I think that's going to um, taint the entire clay lithium clay sector. Yes. Um, but yeah, I I think uh, if you look at uh, you know, uh, multiples, trading multiples, uh, whether that's PNAV or 
enterprise value per ton of LCE, uh, you know, there's one source that kind of trades above the rest and that's, that's hard rock, right? Yeah. Hard rock is tried proven. It has, uh, it, it's evident that it's, it's the quickest to come online general generally. Right. Um, but, but yeah, going, going back now to, you know, the supply problem, um, and, and going back to demand, something, something to note here, and I'll, I'll tie this into grassroots exploration shortly, I, I promise you, but uh, is that lithium ion batteries are brand new. You know, the, the first commercial lithium ion battery available for consumers to purchase, that only came out in the early 90s, right? Like, think about how recent that is. That's a whole new demand stream for lithium. And I have it on this the slide here, lithium demand and the electrification of everything. It was only in 2018 that battery demand actually overtook it, classic industrial demand. So that would be demand from healthcare, glass and ceramics, um, traditional uh, uses of lithium, right? And that demand is still there. It's, it's not going anywhere. But you have this whole new sector now with this, uh, the push to electrify everything um, with electric vehicles, of course, at the forefront of this that are, have created this whole new demand for lithium. Um, and uh, we essentially weren't ready for that. Yeah. And that's why prices have, have spiked. And it's, it's a very immature market, which is why you can see these crazy price fluctuations and in, in Chinese spot prices, right? Like it's it, having something go up rapidly and down is a sign that this is an immature market and in my view, supplies are extremely tight, right? Um, so I, I have this uh, infographic here, um, which is from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, and I included nickel on there. Um, but you could see here that lithium, you know, we'll need a lot more lithium mines uh, by 2035. And then if you go to the next slide, you have the expiration budgets in perspective. Yeah. So these are dollars that have been put into uh exploring for different metals. So gold, gold always gets the most funding. Everyone, everyone loves gold. It's been around for millennia. Um, and uh, it, it gets, as I said, a, a lot of funding, copper as well. And it's something to look at is nickel and lithium. Now, now relaying it back to the previous slide, nickel is still getting more funding than lithium. I know it seems contrary to what we're seeing in the market, yeah. The reality is that the the reason behind that, I suspect, is because it doesn't speak to a shortage of lithium companies out there. There's probably an oversupply of lithium explorers out there, but the dollars that they can allocate into the ground is low because mm. the projects are generally very early stage. There's really not that many, uh, you know, patriots out there. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's you. So. Nickel is still getting more funding than lithium in terms of exploration, despite the fact that we actually need more lithium mines uh, to come online than nickel. I don't mean to bash nickel. I think nickel is very important and evidently we need a lot of it. Um, yes. But I think it just shows the, it puts things in a perspective, right? It is fascinating because you, I would think uh, without looking, other than that kind of the, the Russia war story, I mean, with them being one of the largest nickel mines right now, having one of the largest nickel mines, that I can't. I, it surprises me that uh, because people are so familiar with lithium, and maybe it's a more of a mainstream news that people kind of go, "Oh yeah, I I understand lithium," uh, but the nickel is, is has been more well funded. It is interesting. It's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot more advanced nickel uh, projects out there. We've been exploring for nickel for a while. Um, so on the next slide, I kind of zoom in on on just the lithium, and you can see kind of the breakdown between grassroots uh, versus other types of projects. So grassroots is still uh, getting started here. Yeah. Um, you know, twenty twenty two was a was a big year for grassroots exploration. Um, now I, I mentioned this before that there there's arguably an oversupply of lithium companies, and um, and and with that whenever anything gets hot, right, it attracts a certain type of promoter, right? You know, they're, whether they're chasing crypto or cannabis or now, nowadays, it seems some of them are pivoting from lithium to probably artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, it, it, they're looking for, okay, how can they raise money? Lithium's a way to do it because it's hot. So yeah. whenever anything gets heated, you get a lot of 
you get a lot of people that really aren't in it for the long run. They're in it for the short run, right? Yes. And, and uh, a lot of over promotion in my view. Um, so I think it's very important that investors learn a little bit about the geology here and uh, some of the things that some of the common things that, uh, you know, the promoters might promote yeah. and what that actually means. Thank you.